Well, g'day, flatties and reality defenders. This is Critical Thing from Down Under. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, what you see behind me here is a uh, photo that cannot possibly be taken if the Earth were flat. I'll tell you why. Well, for a start, the sun is shining upwards onto the bottom of the clouds. Now, on a flat Earth, the sun would be above the clouds, so it cannot possibly shine below, from below onto the bottom of the clouds. But here's another problem with this photo here, as far as flat Earth is concerned. The crepuscular rays, which the flatties say is proof that the sun is local, would put the sun right there below the flat ocean. Now, how does that work, flatties? But on a globe, it all works perfectly. So there's no need to make up any uh, stories or fake science or anything. This is just the natural occurrence of how the globe works. Anyway, back to the topic at hand, which is preparation for the final experiment, test run number two. This is very similar to test run number one. And that we've got similar locations. We've got uh, here Red Cliff, Melbourne, and uh, some places in Thailand, a couple of little different ones. We'll switch over to Google Earth and look at what we got here. Locations in Australia. Zoom out, go around the globe. Uh, Bangkok, Konkan, and, and a couple of locations to the uh, far northeast of Thailand this time. Now you might be wondering how am I able to travel so often to Thailand? Well I bought a special deal a couple of years ago uh, where Thai Airways was doing a post-pandemic deal so I got in and bought a, a voucher and I've been trying to use those flights ever since and so it all runs out this year so I had to get all these flights this year done and uh, they were paid for two years ago so that's how I was able to do it this time now I got the special destination Thailand visa I can come and go as I please more or less but anyway uh, I digress now this time I'm trying out a different scale this uh, scale uh, is uh, not too expensive. It's supposed to be a precision scale. Looks nice. Um, the other scale that I was using is uh, looks like the manufacturer is no longer manufacturing scales. Uh, it's a bit of a pity because uh, my other scale, the that type, is very good. Uh, I'm very happy with that, but. It, to move forward, if I should have to buy a new scale, I, I need to test something else. And this one, this one came up as a candidate. There's not many really good, accurate, suitable candidates. But you don't need the super accuracy. It's just that I like to do that. So uh, this one, it uh, calibrates and measures exactly one kilogram there. But uh, when we get to Melbourne, it weighs less than the other one. It's still in the uh, right ballpark. Now all this means is that even though uh, it's calibrated, the calibration can drift a little in terms of, even at the point of calibration, it can be calibrated not quite exactly. So this scale looks like it has some, maybe has some non-linearity or some calibration little quirk. So it, it's not, it's, the uh, if the scale was calibrated c exactly then this would be 1000.84 but that's not too bad not not too bad and then in bangkok it's uh, lower again so it's consistently lower so as long as the calibration is stable then that's what really matters and then uh, we move to konkan and oh, i'll show you a couple of photos like i did before so this is a uh, motorcycle with a custom fuel tank and some very innovative mounting for the side panel and the uh, muffler and then this is uh, central Konkan 
This is pronounced Fuku, apparently. I don't know how you would pronounce that. And uh, there's a reminder there. Please do not leave your value belonging in the car. Now, and again, the weight here at Konken is lower than with the other scale. So the calibration is definitely uh, a smaller, gives a smaller weight all, all around. Um, when we do the analysis, uh, this will all come out. And then uh, we took a trip to Tat Phnom, which is on the far east of Thailand, in the northeast on the Mekong River. And there they're reading 99928. Anyway, we're back to Kon Ken, and uh, this uh, very similar reading to before. And then uh, back to Tat Phnom, a uh, different date, a similar reading. This time uh, they had a uh, street party going on on Friday night. And uh, that was uh, good to walk around there. And then we were a little bit north to Nukon Phnom. And it's not too far away, so the reading would be similar, of course. Similar height. And there's a uh, coffee shop there on the Mekong. So you're looking across the Mekong there to Laos. And uh, you can sit there and drink coffee. Now, this is not related to the weight, but I thought this was very interesting. So I went to Ubal Rathana Dam, as I have a few times. And for the first time, I noticed this here, which is seems to suggest that the high water mark, the full level of the dam, is 182 metres uh, above mean sea level. Now, I knew that Konken was about 180 metres. So I'm thinking, yeah, well, that's probably about right. So I took a reading. And uh, from where I am, which is a little bit higher than the dam there, I've got 198 metres where I was standing. So that would put me about 16 metres above the water. That's, an, that's probably about right. See, I'm up higher there. Right, so that was just an interesting sideline. Now, back in Konken, we're still measuring similar, but, you know, not exactly the same every measurement, but uh, within an, uh, a reasonable error tolerance. Back to Suvinabum, Bangkok. A uh, slightly different reading there from the first time. So there's a little bit of variation. And uh, an interesting thing on the flight back. Now this must be a newer aircraft. They've got a different system on the seat back display. Now I, I miss the old airspeed and altitude indications. But this one shows the path that you're travelling as you travel it. And yes, it correctly depicts the uh, Earth as a globe. Now, for all you uh, Flat Earth fans uh, who swear by the Gleason map, you can see that this is the direct path here between uh, Bangkok and Melbourne, and uh, it would fly on the Gleason map slightly to the east of Darwin there and across central Australia. Now, um, we are told that the uh, by the Flat Earthers that the Gleason's map is the most accurate map and because of all these emergency landings and everything this is the map that disproves the globe except all of those emergency landings uh, use uh, straw manning the globe model in some way so here uh, we can tell that all right so we should fly from Bangkok to Melbourne across the center of Australia but we don't right and anyone can look out the window and see where we're going. So here I've uh, tracked this on um, uh, flight radar. This is the flight that I took. And at the time that I took that picture, flight radar shows that the plane is in the exact same place as it was in the other picture. Now, as we went down uh, uh, over Adelaide, as you would on a globe, you would fly this route. And we did. So there's uh, we're flying over this um, this section here where there are some landmarks, Lake Alexandrina and Lake Albert. So I pulled up Flight Radar 24 afterwards, and at the same time that as I, I took that photo of the seat back, then Flight Radar 24 shows the plane in the same position. So everything's congruent, isn't it? And then there's a camera on the tail of the plane 
and you can look out there and you can clearly see that these landmarks there's the coastline there's Lake Albert there's Lake Alexandrina and uh, so everything gels exactly like the globe model but I have never ever seen not one flat earther has been able to take a picture of flying over the center of Australia when the plane is showing on the map as over Adelaide never not one yet they completely insist that all this is faked but you can look out the window or you can look at the camera in this case well I didn't have a window so but you can look out and you can see where you are and that's definitely not over the middle of Australia now this one also had a camera under the plane very cool very interesting to watch that in the landing so back in Melbourne uh, similar reading to when we go down on the way down and then calibration check at Redcliffe and this is something I liked about this scale it remained pretty stable even though the calibration was different to the other one it gives fairly stable readings so now we go into the analysis and uh, so the red line here is the WGS 84 assuming the calibration is uh, correct the green line there is what we measured on the scale and uh, so you can see there are some differences uh, at the both ends of the the uh, the scale there's differences and similar this one's a uh, red line and a orange line now if I adjust for the calibration being different I do take a least squares uh, plot then it's much closer that's the blue line and over here that's the um, that's the blue line there too so this is the return journey and this is the go-to journey so it, it's all even though it's not as accurate as the other scale it's still very very accurate and this is how accurate this is the WGS84 model explains 99.6% of the variation. So even with a little bit of variation like that, it's because all the dots are in the right place that uh, where the WGS84 model says they should be, then that's a very high correlation. And people try to tell me that, oh, you haven't taken into account air pressure, uh, magnetism, uh, whatever. Yeah, okay, so how can those random factors um, line up exactly with how the WGS84 model predicts? So, I don't know, but maybe you're trying to tell me that 100 monkeys on 100 typewriters can easily type a novel, because that's the same scenario. Now, here's a plot of all the points uh, normalized to a... Uh, one height and uh, you see they're all clustered around there in the right place and as usual I put uh, all my readings that I've all ever collected all on the one graph it's getting quite crowded there now and the red arrows are in the area of the predictions that we want to see when we go to Punta Arenas and uh, to uh, Union Glacier so yes, the donations are still open. Now, I don't have any memberships or anything like that or Patreons or whatever. But if you like my work, then I would appreciate a donation towards the Antarctic trip because it's quite a bit of money. A few people have donated uh, already and that's fantastic. Um, I'm very grateful for the donations I have received. It's helped a lot. And uh, yeah, the link will be in the description. And of course, we have to listen to Phuket Word. Now, listen, Phuket Word. If you if you see this, look, come to my channel and put in the comments. Is uh, you're not banned here, like I'm banned on on your channel. Come here and just make a note that you acknowledge that I've done this experiment and uh, that you were wrong in this clip. And you know, I can stop playing this clip now, even though it never gets old. But here we go goes on about the difference in uh, the weight of things at the equator compared to other places in the earth. Have you actually gone and measured it? Have yes. you ever done it? Yes. We understand that in the model 
based on the spin and centrifugals, <coughs> centripetal, centripetal, whatever forces, that that's the result that you can calculate based yes. on your model. Yes, we did. But can has anyone has anyone actually gone and measured this so-called difference? Has anyone actually measured that a kilogram weighed in the you know somewhere up north is any different to a kilogram weighed on the equator? Yeah. Has anyone actually gone and done that? No, it's they weird. have not. What? A kilogram is a kilogram wherever you are on the earth. But we have. <laughs> Let's see you put a comment below and uh, retract that. Thank you. We'll see you in the next video.